Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and good afternoon. I'm Dana Goldman. I'm the dean of the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy and the co-director of the USC Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. And uh, as part of our charter to have difficult conversations, I'm especially pleased to be speaking with Faye Waddleton, uh, former president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America, the nation's oldest and largest voluntary reproductive health provider. Obviously, with the Supreme Court considering overturning Roe v. Wade, there's never been a better time to have uh, someone with her experience and insight uh, in conversation with our community. Uh, for those who don't know, Ms. Waddleton served as head of Planned Parenthood Federation from 1978 to 1992, becoming a distinguished champion for reproductive health care. She was the first woman to lead the organization after founder Margaret Sanger stepped down in 1959. She was also the first African-American to lead Planned Parenthood Federation, and she remains the youngest and longest tenured to have served as president and CEO. Uh, she restructured the federation and led it to become the nation's seventh largest nonprofit organization. Under her leadership, Planned Parenthood Federation expanded reproductive health care services from one, one million patients to about five million patients. She's currently the co-founder and director of EROQ Quantum Hardware Inc a quantum computing company. So again, in the vanguard in yet another area. She also serves on numerous boards and governing bodies for public and private corporations, academic institutions, and high impact philanthropic organizations. And uh, in particular, she is a member of the advisory board for the USC Schaefer Center and uh, I'm really grateful to her for advice and leadership. And I just want to say she's been a mentor of mine for many years, going back to when I was at RAND. So, Faye, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Dana. You know how much I admire you. So we're a mutual admiration couple <laughs> here. I've learned so much from you and so deeply and sincerely admire your leadership and the way you've taken the Schaefer Center to great heights of impact. Thank you. I appreciate that. Very, and you're always you're, pushing you're us. You are so needed. Yeah, and <laughs> you're, you're filling a tremendous need in public policy and articulation and application of how policies affect personal lives. Thank you. And what a perfect segue. You know, the, the um, Supreme Court Justices Alito's briefing uh, was leaked to the public. Uh, and soon we're going to get a decision on this topic. And it's a remarkable to me how it has reinvigorated the national discourse uh, surrounding abortion and reproductive rights. Uh, what do you think this draft or where we are, where, what do you think of the history of reproduct, what this means for reproductive rights in America? Well, I think what it means is the, on the one point that you made, which I think is is important um, and, and an unfortunate importance, is that it has seemingly awakened people's awareness of the threat to reproductive rights. And that threat has been ongoing for over 30 years, actually, since before Roe v. Wade, un, almost unrelenting. And it has been very um, surprising to me that there seemed to be such great um, amazement that people feel that Mr. Alito's draft decision, and it was a draft, we don't know that that decision, in fact, will be actually handed down. Assuming that it is, it follows a long line of uh, judicial decisions in recent years that have undermined Roe v. Wade. And frankly, Dana, we really don't have Roe v. Wade now. It has been eroded over the years, and we have allowed it to be eroded. We have not paid attention to Supreme Court nominations as crucial to the political and the voting decisions that we make. And so we now have a court that it consists of six Catholic practicing Catholics, one of whom is a liberal, five of whom are not, one belongs to a Catholic cult. Um, and there is definitely a point of view that really 
undermines all of the gains that have been made in reproductive rights, including contraceptive practices. Uh, so the focus now is on abortion. Um, in Gonzales, uh, in 2007, the Supreme Court took away the prohibition on making abortion illegal if a woman's health is endangered. We didn't seem to mind about that. Um, in earlier in Casey, uh, Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey, uh, the Supreme Court said, well, you know, you can impose restrictions if as long as not as as long as those restrictions are not unduly burdensome. Uh, that was left to be defined. And the states have gone right ahead and imposed burdens on women, primarily the women who can least afford those burdens uh, as a way of weakening Roe. So the, the illusion that we have lived under um, all the way back to 1980 when the Supreme Court upheld the denial of Medicaid funding for poor women's abortions. We have lived and America has lived under the, the illusion of Roe v. Wade, when in fact we did not have Roe v. Wade as we knew it in, in 1973. And you're referring to the Hyde Amendment, correct? I am referring to the Hyde Amendment. I'm referring to all the bombings and burnings that took place after Roe v. Wade and preceding Roe v. Wade. Uh, the uh, efforts that were made to uh, to in, to intervene in contraceptive practices uh, in 19. You know, it's it's amazing to me. There seems to be a lack of awareness that in 1964, the year I graduated from college, contraception among married couples was illegal. Uh, so the practice of our most private functions as human beings uh, has is a relatively young one for us, although abortion once upon a time was legal before the medical establishment intervened and made it illegal in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, you know, we we seem to think that this is, came up on a midnight clear. It did not. Right. There have been three, four, five now decades of women being able to and, and people being able to make these decisions for themselves with, with increasing government intrusion. Yeah, I, I want to get to that, that issue before I ask. I want to come back to this theme about um, backgrounds and how that influences decisions. But one of the points you made is that in some ways policy is being made here by the, you know, we're a policy school and we're interested in how we decide these things. And, the, you know, the Supreme Court also just issued a ruling on the Second Amendment uh, and gun rights. So we're seeing there's you can be a, a, you can have a very strict interpretation of the Constitution or an expansive one. But this notion that the judiciary is making a lot of policy decisions is very clear and some people like it when they have the right makeup of the Supreme Court and some don't, is one of the issues here that we never quite solved this at the federal legislative level. We never dealt with privacy uh, and a right to privacy and maybe it's even a constitutional question. Well, you know, Tina, when, when I hear the struggle that seems to be a part of this debate about whether the whether the Supreme Court is making policy. I suppose you can define anything that affects the lives of people as policy if it yeah, comes exactly. from one of our branches of government. But the real remarkable quality of our democracy and our system of three branches of government is that we have adapted. I sit before you as an African American woman. My gender and my race were not included in the Constitution. And if there had not been an interpretation that was broader than those that dealt with my great grandmother's slave owner, who, who, by the way, served in the Congress of the United States before emancipation, I might not be sitting here because it may have been seen as well the court did not, you know, did not interpret the 14th Amendment properly. And it is policy and, and we have to leave all of that to the states. 
Well, there are certain fundamental rights to being an American that you don't leave to the states. We're not sitting here discussing the censorship of newspapers by state residents as to whether a state will decide whether we will have freedom of the press or freedom of religion or any of the other freedoms that have been recognized under a broader contemporary, contemporary decisions of the court that recognize real life. We are looking you and I are together on these machines that were never invented. The whole science of them did mm -hmm. not come about until after many of the decisions that we rely upon were made. So I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite cynical about the, the, the policy argument that gets dragged out when it's something that you don't really like. But on matters of personal privacy, on your bedroom on your body. We don't ask people to go to war for us any, any longer for the, to protect our country's democracy if they don't want to do so. Yeah. So the, the, the whole notion that the government should intervene in a woman's most private function and dictate the circumstances in which she will reproduce, it's, un, it's just really... It's really, if not just outrageous, it's it's really remar pretty remarkable and a pretty remarkable possibility of enforcement by government fiat that can be quite dangerous for women's lives. Well, you obviously have a very passionate view on it and it's make a compelling argument and not surprising. Well, I mean, you know, Dana, listen, you know, I'm a nurse midwife by, by training and by, by my early practice. Um, I am old enough to remember when Roe v. Wade was not handed down. I ran Planned Parenthood in Dayton, Ohio. We sent women to New York that were often the victims of opportunists and people that exploited their vulnerability and their desperation. I trained as a nurse midwife at Harlem Hospital, and I saw women that came in infected and using all manner of uh, of measures to end a pregnancy. And that's the other thing, Dana, the Supreme Court didn't invent pregnancy termination. It is an ancient practice that women have endured as far as records can document. The question is whether they will be safe, whether those measures will be safe, or they will be dangerous for the women, for women and the most vulnerable among us. Yes. Uh, so I want to come back to something you pointed out, which is um, the makeup of the Supreme Court. And you talked about their background. And I, I'm curious uh, about I know you were raised in a devout uh, Christian home and, I, you know, you talked about being a nurse. I wonder how that has influenced your background, has influenced your views on this and also the career choice you made. Well, it's a, do we have to personalize it. But, <laughs> no, it's okay. Do we have all afternoon for me to tell you about my upbringing as the daughter of not just a minister, but an evangelist? We were on the road a lot during my upbringing. Um, my mother, at, when I was about six, decided that she wanted to fulfill her calling to the ministry, which she felt in her late teens. And she was an evangelical, very conservative. Uh, uh, Church of God was the denomination out of Anderson, Indiana. Um, it was a denomination that many of the domestic missionaries uh, came through the South after emancipation, and her father was converted uh, to this denomination, and that was the way she was raised. Um, we spent, I was often left with church members to attend various schools. After the third grade, I didn't attend the same school two years in a row until my junior year of high school. Um, my parents were on the road. My mother pastored churches in, in Ohio and Mississippi and Louisiana. We spent two years uh, with my mother pastoring a church in all white Columbus, Nebraska. Uh, so I had quite an upbringing and I saw a lot as a result of my mother's dedication to religious evangelism, evangel evangelical evangelism. Um, so from that, I certainly learned a point of view about very conservative lifestyles and the rigidity of doctrine and imposition on personal and family life. When I went to Ohio State to uh, study for a bachelor's in nursing, I saw a different world. 
I was exalted, exhorted rather, not exalted, but I was exalted. Yes, you were exalted to be, too. <laughs> to be to be selected to um, uh, to enter the nursing program at Ohio State because it was pretty rigid. Um, but that introduced me to a world in my late teens. I went to college at sixteen, but in my late teens, it introduced me to a world that I was had not been exposed to in my rigid upbringing uh, in the church. Uh, and I, I was challenged by the professors in my training that it was a calling, and it was a calling for human service. And it wasn't just human service to be a missionary, as my mother had hoped, but rather to serve the suffering and to reach with compassion and understanding for the circumstances of people's lives that may not have been those of mine. Um, so the doctrine of care and service was pretty, well, in my upbringing, it was the foundation was laid on a very rigid and, and and for me personally challenging way. In my professional development, it was expansive, and it was understanding that human suffering is real, that the circumstances of lives are often very complex. It's another reason why politicians have no business meddling in our personal with our personal bodies, because the stories that can be told when you are a healthcare professional are pretty complex and often very tragic. Thank you for that. And one of the points you're making implicitly is, you know, we're thinking about the needs of people who are underserved. And I want to talk about how technology has changed here, medical technology and how we do this. And during COVID, for example, we saw the that one way to get around state lines you could actually uh, have an abortion via telemedicine using new um, pills uh, you, uh, administered in certain ways. But I worry about access and the ability to get around and probably they'll close that loophole uh, would be my guess. Uh, but, you know, the technology around abortion has changed and but there's an issue of access for certain groups, and especially, I think, women uh, who are impoverished, uh, uh, women of color. Could you talk a little bit about the equity side of this as well, if we that maybe some people will still have access and some won't? Well, some people had access before Roe v. Wade. Let us not <laughs> assume that it was a fair uh, level playing field. So the question is, how much access and at what peril will you have that access? Um, and um, I just stepping back in the latter state uh, uh, years of my time as president of Planned Parenthood Federation, RU486, the abortion pill that you refer to, Crystal, Mif okay. was being developed by Uclef, uh, Roussel Uclef yeah. in Paris. And we actually, I actually went to Paris and met with the CEO of the pharmaceutical company to, sit, to ask if Planned Parenthood could be selected to bring the drug to uh, new, uh, America. And so this goes back 30 years. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we've been playing around with the, the medical methodology for a, a pretty long time. And as was is the case with oral contraceptives, the improvements in that technology are pretty significant. They're, they're, they're not as crude as it was when the, the, the medication was first uh, formulated. Um, so I there will be those that will have access and will be able to navigate the barriers that are going to be placed or that will be attempted um, on, on, on those particular, that particular methodology. I have, you know, I think if the Supreme Court upholds this enforcement of pregnancy on women, and it's kind of interesting how Judge Alito's document seems to disengage women from the process, except in some cold, almost mean-spirited reference. But if for some reason this decision comes down, we have been fighting against the efforts to cut off access to contraceptives for as long as Roe v. Wade has been around. So we're not 
this is a much bigger picture than the procedure to terminate an unintended unwanted pregnancy. This really is about controlling women's reproductive lives. And I know there are those probably on this webcast that will say it's more than just women, but anyone who has the capacity to carry a pregnancy to term, it's about controlling. There are no um, uh, laws that I'm aware of, no proposals to regulate male reproduction. This is a target of, of control over reproduction for those who can be pregnant and bear their children. And, and so I think that that there were laws, and here, here I defend very strongly Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of Planned Parenthood, who came to that work out of the tragedies of women, white women on the Lower East Side of New York who had repeated pregnancies and had seemed to have no control over their reproduction. And she went to Europe and found methods and brought them back. But relevant to the question that you ask and the technology, well, the technology in the early 1900s was pen and paper, right? And so she wrote her literature and her leaflets and stood on the street corners of New York City, not down South, as she is often characterized, aiming at Black people. And I'm an African-American, so I'd be the first to condemn that any, any effort to coerce or to regulate uh, reproduction among my people. But she stood out to, in the belief that with information, women would have better control. I don't, there were laws passed that made it illegal to pass that information in the mail, through the mails. They were called Comstock laws. I didn't think the day would ever come, but the day has arrived in which there is now reference that we need more Comstock-like like laws in this debate. My, my point is this is not just narrow a narrow issue of abortion. This is much broader about personal liberty, about personal agency, about the need for the government to step out of women's personal bodies. And so there are reports already, my, my colleague and friend, that pharmacists are beginning to draw back from providing medical methods because they just don't want to get involved in the controversy. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I ran Planned Parenthood in Dayton, Ohio, before Roe v. Wade, but after New York had, had reformed its laws, New York became an abortion mill. Everyone came to abortion and every scalawag in the, con in, in the city and in the state held up a sign saying, I can provide an abortion. We had to go through a referral agent to be sure that women got safe termination in a state where it was legal. And so there will be efforts on every side that will continue. And when the women came back to Dayton, if they had a complication, the doctors didn't want to care for them because they didn't want to, they did not want to get involved. And so there will be those that will, you know, will, will definitely suffer if, if this law is, is, if these laws are upheld. Um, but the ones who will suffer will be the ones who will not be able to escape the barriers and will not have the, have the resources to go to another state and will use devices of their own making, which will be dangerous and even deadly for them. And that's the great tragedy that we may be coming upon. Yeah, I, I do think we will see a, a black market, a uh, gray market in some cases, emerge around the provision of this and in some sense that brings us well, back the, to the, where the, you were yeah the gray market may will certainly emerge because there will be human ingenuity but mm -hmm. the laws will chase them if we allow these laws to stand exactly. they will chase them they will harass them they will harass the women um that have chosen to uh select that method to try to have their own personal agency without the interference of meddling people who know nothing about them. I mean, Dana, what would it look like for me to come tell you and your wife what you should do with your reproduction? I mean, it's unseemly. It's it's disgusting, frankly. Um, it's unseemly when my wife tells me what to do right. on her own, so. 
about matters that are not quite yeah, exactly. So I, know, I, I think it's remarkable. You think I have a say in that relationship. Uh, <laughs> I do want to ask you, you know, one thing about uh, about the polarity in this. And, you know, we have a very polarized country when you you know, this is obviously a highly charged issue and it there's a tension between re religious morality and personal liberty that comes up. Um, and, you know, Americans have decidedly mixed opinions on this topic. And I wonder, is there a middle ground here? Um, well, I mean, and Dana, did, would a legislative solution get us closer to that? Legislating a woman's body? Really? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. No, I mean, you know. I, is there, there are, a common ground? The common ground is you make the decision for yourself and I make the decision for myself. That's common ground. Anything that you give up on that score is me, means that I'm giving it up. I'm I'm giving up something that you have no right to, and that right. you should have no right to. And that's where there seems to be this determined effort to disconnect women from this. We're talking about a condition that women put a, or a state that women enter when we choose to be pregnant. And I I have been pregnant. I have a daughter. So I know what pregnancy is, and it's not an inconsequential condition. If a woman is not pregnant, her condition would be considered critical in terms of the changes that go on in our bodies and the life-threatening conditions that we adapt to in order to carry a pregnancy to a viability and, and delivery. So I don't know what common ground do you, do you want me to give up? For you to enter my life and my body to say, I mean, I don't have, you know, as I said earlier, we don't even require that for the defense of our country. So why are women subjected to the opinions? And here was one of the beauties. Sorry, I don't mean to filibuster you, but yeah, I am filibuster. <laughs> you, <laughs> that's uh, fine. <laughs> um, you know, I recently read Roe v. Wade and I participated in an audio reading of Roe v. Wade. Okay. And and Mr. Blackman in, you know, 50 years ago, half a century ago, discussed the difficulty and the struggles, the theological struggles and the values problems, and that these are often conflicting issues in a person's life. And that's why they're unsuitable for political intervention or judicial intervention, and it should be left to the moral framework and the fabric that guides our personal decisions and to the theologists and the philosophers to compel us in, in terms of our thinking. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't understand the concept of common ground. Um, what ground do you have to be in my personal life? Should you have to be in my personal life? When I may encounter, if I am pregnant and don't want to continue that pregnancy, a condition that could in fact threaten my life. Uh, that seems to me to be, now we could enter common ground on prevention, on teaching our children about their sexuality and the healthy aspect of who they are, their humanity. We could really broadly make sure that contraception and birth control and reproductive services very broadly are widely available regardless of gender regardless of sexual practices that we're not an, that we should no longer be an, an ignorant population about this aspect because of the biases but even that is under attack but, you know the ignorance uh, soldiers are on the on the march you know let's take the books away and let's take the literature away and it, it's, it's it just seems remarkable in the 21st century that we're behaving as though we're in the 17th century. Well, one of the things from, you know, I work obviously on, do a lot of work on investments in children. And one of the things I'm often, that I find remarkable is that once the child is born, we tend to not pay attention anymore. So for example, when a woman is pregnant, she'll be told 12 times on average, don't smoke. But guess what? Once she takes the baby home, no one is checking whether the child is exposed to smoke and things like that. And so it, it's often our country, although we talk about, you know, the concerns of, um, 
in the womb, for example, I'm rather surprised that once a child goes home, they're often left on their own. Uh, and that's not the way other countries do it. But. Well, we're, we're concerned to a point, I mean, we claim the, those who want to regulate women's reproduction claim concerns for in the womb, but we also have one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the developing developed world. Now, that's a very complicated subject, not, not subjective to a very simple answer. Uh, so I want for those of, for the professionals on the line that will argue with me about that, I get it, you know, maternal mortality is complex. However, women, um, this is no, women should not be forced to be brood mares to bring children into the world for other people. And we should not delude ourselves to believe that this is about the care of children. This is really about the control of women. And that's what this is about. Yeah, you've, you've, <laughs> you've made that point quite strongly and articulately. Thank you. I do want to point out Alice Chen, Professor Alice Chen has worked on this, uh, on um, child mortality and maternal mortality. And she's noted that at the, it, in high SES groups, the United States does better than anyone, but at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, we look like a lot of uh, less developed countries. countries. And so yeah, it's not, it is, you know, we, there's three Americas, you know, uh, <laughs> when you start looking at it, uh, but I, I want to. And, and also those that we look at it when when the woman presents herself as opposed to seeing the condition for for pregnancy and childbearing starts in her infancy. And so that really means that we have to tackle the fundamental problems of equity. Now, I know that there are the, yeah. the theories of racial um, discrepancies in terms of whatever our DNA is saying or not saying, uh, but we, we still fragment and we compartmentalize our care that really doesn't give us the outcome that we, we really hope for as a developed country, a sophisticated country. Yes, for sure. Okay, we're getting some very interesting questions. So I hope I'd like to, we have about 10 minutes left. Is that um, all? How can yeah, we I know. Off this? <laughs> I'm sorry, I talk too much. And didn't I know, it. Dana, you know, when we, you and I get going and the time flies. <laughs> The time uh, one interesting question is about uh, a synagogue in Florida that actually has filed a lawsuit challenging Florida's law prohibiting abortion on the basis that it violates Jewish teachings. And so, right. in other words, religious freedom requires that you allow for access to abortion. Is this a viable well, it, it is. It is. I saw that also. It is. Uh, it is an interesting approach, and I, I hope that other parts of the Jewish community will pick up on it. And the Amikai that will certainly come about. Um, it is. It re, it harkens back to Mr. Block, Blackman's point that these are tough issues that theologians have struggled with, and should we a woman should be guided by her theocracy and 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 those that guide her morally and religiously. So I, I I certainly every angle, every angle needs not to be how do we find a safe place for women to have pregnancy terminations if the Supreme Court moves ahead with this outrage. Every effort should be made to fight back. This is the time to fight back. There have there has been too much accommodation that endangers women's fundamental lives and fundamental rights. So I, I would hope that that the Jewish community would stand up as it has, has done in so many other instances in which human rights have been imperiled and uh, that there will be lots and lots of cases all over the country that challenge that on that point. I certainly would not speak against it having been a preacher's kid, okay? <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah. uh, um, bravo well, for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and after all, freedom of religion is the First Amendment. You that's know, right. The first thing that we said we want to protect. Some other, uh, another question, and you've kind of touched on this a little bit. You know, we did frame this as um, women's rights and a fundamental right. Uh, but you did talk about the rights of couples to privately 
make decisions about contraception and the like, which goes beyond women. Uh, there's a question about whether you're worried about uh, this is a slippery slope to broader rights, healthcare, LGBTQ, uh, et cetera. Um, could you comment on that, please? I think it, it's, it's the slope is very slippery that it started. The slope started more than 50 years ago. So I don't know how slippery. I mean, it started in the late, in the mid 60s when the Catholic Church decided that it would be, that this would be their priority politically. What we have to do is wake up to this element that binds our agency uh, and that all of these matters are personal and should be left personal and private. Uh, and should be, and you know again I'm a preacher's kid. Whoever wants to be converted and go to the altar and you know ask forgiveness for sins or talk to the priest or however we do the the hocus pocus of religion should be free to do that without persecution. By the way, and I I think that one of the reasons that I was able to be effective as an as as a spokesperson for so long is because I understood the language of my opposition. I understood their mentality because that was what I was raised on. But I also understood the dangers because of my profession, and the and the, and also having been exposed to a broader world to understand the implications in a broad context that was de that were denied me when I was growing up. And, and so there need to be more Dana Goldmans that speak up. Um, everyone needs to take responsibility for where we are today, not sitting back and saying, this is a slippery slope. Well, why is it a slippery slope? These are not acts of God. We allow this to happen every time we vote for someone that we know they're going to go and nominate a Supreme Court candidate and confirm a Supreme Court candidate, then we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, we let this happen and we have to take it back. And that's where we are today. Yeah, so I'm gonna uh, I combine two questions in response to that um, because you know, you've know you said, we're gonna vote for someone who's gonna appoint a Supreme Court justice who will uphold our rights, but you know, I think the first is that we have a broader right to privacy that is at stake here. That's one thing. That's and personal correct. liberty. You, you can call it privacy or personal liberty. Uh, but the second is, and, it, you know, I asked this question earlier, but I'm going to come back to it, which is really is this is the right strategy to deal with this legislatively or to even think about a constitutional amendment? And, you know, we no. had... Yeah, hey, and listen, I want you, that, you can go on record with this one. Oh, no, I, I, I'm very, I've had this debate. Um, one of my really close friends, and may, may she rest in peace because I loved her dearly, was Bella Abzug. And wow. yeah. she and I, right after Webster, were having a debate about how this was going to all end up. And I remember we were we were in a cab coming from the airport in New York. And I said to her over the phone, you know, Bella, the only answer to this is to have a, to really launch a constitutional amendment to prove a reproductive rights constitutional amendment that the, 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 the constitution protects the fundamental right of reproducing yourself. That it's not by government imposition and a government that can force you to continue a pregnancy is also a government that has the powers to force you to terminate a pregnancy if, it's a, if it is in the state interest. And we have examples of this. So it's not, that's not imaginative. Uh, so I, 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 I would long for a, a constitutional amendment that would broadly settle this as fundamental, fundamental to who we are as Americans not to the circumstances of our residency, to who we are, where we live in a state. Um, I, I, I think that that would be, that'll be a very long, because I think that there is still some disconnect among people who support this right to believing, you know, your questions are, can we find a common ground? You know, 
when we move from asking that question, then maybe we were we will be on our way to really solidifying this as fundamental as freedom of speech, freedom of movement. And that's really all that I ask for. No persecution for those people that picket our clinics and then come and get our services and go back to the picket line. Let them be because it ought to be a fundamental agency that they decide. Yeah. And actually that gets to, we have time for our last question, which is, you know, educating students. We are a policy school. And, you know, I think there, there, there's a question of how young you go, but the reality is that um, talking about what are our fundamental rights, how are they protected? How are they enshrined in the constitution and the law? is always a useful discussion to have. And then how do those change as the world changes? As times change, yes, as the yeah. world changes. And how and do we know that, you know, with, like I said, the change in technology, the way we come, you said pen and paper, you know, now we have control of giant media and that changes the way you think about freedom of speech Absolutely. quite fundamentally. And well, so, it certainly changes the interpretation of the fire in the theater, right? Yeah, exactly. The primitive concept of that's um, right. You can't you can't yell fire in theater and cause everybody to stampede themselves to death. Right, and then <laughs> some people may be watching that tonight. Okay. <laughs> so without going into you know, we like yeah, to have difficult you know what, conversations. Dana, that's why this is the greatest country in the world. At the same time that we're going through terrible, awful. You know, people say that our democracy is so fragile. And I look at these people on TV who stood up against a president. And then I think to myself, that was democracy in action. You know, the people stood up and said, we're not going to do dishonest things that abrogates the will of the people. And, you know, while I mean, I'm old enough to remember the 60s and the 70s, the cities burned. Emmett Till was bludgeoned and, and massacred. You know, my own family provided safe houses for the kids that came down in 63 in Mississippi to vote, to register people to vote for those kids, one of whom was from New York, to register Black people to vote. You know, we can't lose a perspective on where we've come from and what is worth fighting over and getting ready to fight back to regain the liberty that we have had. And by the way, men benefit from this liberty also, even if they don't have a uterus, uh, that that their partners can have this choice that hopefully they are a part of that decision as well. Yeah. Well, Faye, I wanna thank you for taking the time to speak with me. It's, you know, your passion, but also your commitment to service is, regardless of where you end up in this debate, you have to admire what you've accomplished and how you've gone about it. And you do it with grace. And I just appreciate that you're out there talking about these things and providing mentorship to people who care about our country. So. Well, Dana, um, I, uh, you know, it's, I appreciate you also because in your way you play a really important role and Everyone should be asking themselves right now, how do I play a role in turning this around, not continuing to say, how did this happen and what do we do next and how do we open uh, homes and and shelter for people to get their abortion? Let's not have that conversation. Let's say, no, we're not going to open shelters. We're going to fight back and regain the right that is being snatched from women. That's what we have to do if we care about our, our democracy, if we care about human beings, if we care about advancing the quality of human life. Okay, well, thank you and appreciate thank you for having me. strong words and, you know, take care and thank you to our audience for listening in and uh, everyone have a nice afternoon. Take thank care. Thank you for having me, Dana.